Augustine has a famous comment in the Confessions where he says, ask me what time it is, I can tell you. But if you ask me what time is, I'm at a loss. In many ways, this inaugurates the history of the philosophy of investigating the question of the meaning of time. And it's helpful, I think, to go back to the Greeks, to Aristotle, to Aristotle's understanding of time in order to begin thinking about the meaning of time. Now, for Aristotle, time is a measure of motion. It's a way of counting or ordering the motion or the becoming of things. So decay happens, generation and corruption, physis, physics, nature becomes, and then we count it. Then we order it. Time is a way of ordering motion. Now, how do we order motion? According to Aristotle, we do so in terms of duration, succession, or simultaneity. Time, then, is dependent, in many ways, upon things, upon the becoming of things. So time is not a container, like a glass of water, in which motion occurs. Time is the way of measuring the motion that occurs. In this sense, time is objective, if you will, because it counts the motion or the movements, the becoming of objects. I, the subject, follow the objects. This is the concept of time that, to a great extent, dominates the way we think about time and continues to dominate our thinking about time uh, to this day. Now, in many ways, all of this changes with Kant, although there are still some philosophers and many scientists today who continue with this original Greek understanding of time as the measure of motion. Physics, for example, is completely dominated by this notion of time. However, with Kant, all of this is reversed in the Copernican revolution in thought that occurs in the Critique of Pure Reason. While for Aristotle, time was a measure of motion of objects, for Kant, time is the schema that allows objects to move, that allows them to become. So, if I have a sense, an imagination, or an image, or any knowledge of things, it's because time is already there. How so? Once again, just as for Aristotle, time schematizes now the motion of objects in terms of duration, succession, simultaneity. But if something is, if I sense something, it's now or it's then. If I imagine something, whether it's real or not real, a horse or a unicorn, it's at one moment in time or at another moment in time. If there's truth, which for Kant is the correspondence of the concept in the mind and the object in the world, well, that happens now, homogeneous in time. This is why in the schematism chapter of the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, that's precisely the notion of time that uh, allows us to have any kind of knowledge of the world. So, for Kant, time is subjective insofar as it is the schema of the way that I sense, imagine, and also know the world. But does that mean that time is subjective? On the contrary. For Kant, time is still objective because it's the objective, objectively valid schema of the subject. In this way, Kant is not doing philosophical anthropology. The critique of pure reason is a critique of pure reason, not a critique of human reason. Now, how is it possible that time could be both valid for objects in Aristotle and subjects in Kant? Heidegger answers that it's because time is universal. For Heidegger, time is universal because there's nothing outside of time. Even that which is supposedly atemporal or supratemporal, they too are temporal insofar as they are at all times. But Heidegger's understanding of time is not that of Husserl, not of phenomenology. Time, according to Heidegger at least, uh, in his understanding of uh, phenomenology, time does not constitute objects or beings. Rather, time reveals the being of beings, the way they always already were, objects and subjects. So time opens up the difference between 
being and beings and between beings and between our way of knowing beings and the way they are. This is what Heidegger calls the ontological difference or the onto-ontological difference. And so time is what allows beings to come to presence for us and go out into absence. This is why Heidegger says that time is the how of being. Because for Heidegger, if time is the duration, the succession, or the simultaneity of beings, these are merely ways in which beings are present or come to presence and go out into absence or are absent. So for Heidegger, not only objects, but we too, Dasein, subjects if you will, are characterized by time, our way of being present and absent, coming into presence and going out into absence. And it's time that allows these ways of being to show themselves. Do we have anything more to say about time? Well, as Heidegger says, language speaks. So my question then is, what does language tell us about time that might not yet have been included in Heidegger's thinking of time, or even in the history of the philosophy of time from Aristotle, the Greeks, to the present. What does language tell us about time? Language tells us that being, verbs, every verb, every happening, every event, is tensed. In other words, it has past, present, or future time. And time is expressed in language in terms of tense. This is why all verbs in German are Zeitwörter, time words. They have their time. But as linguistics tells us, verbs not only have time, they also have aspect. What does it mean then to think of a verb having aspect as well, if it's complete or incomplete aspect? There's a difference, for example, between I fall and I am falling, between I fell and I have fallen. Even though those are both in the same time, French differentiates between uh, passé composé and imparfait. And this is true of many languages. This is an aspectual difference that is precisely not reducible to a temporal or a time difference, or a tense difference, if you will. So all verbs, even the verb being, has time and aspect. And it's precisely this aspect that is the unthought in the history of philosophy of time. So if we're going to think about being, then we also have to think about time and aspect. If objects then come to presence and go out of absence, go out into absence, then they do so both with time, tensed, and aspect. In this way, we can, if you will, rewrite Augustine's original comment. If you ask me what time is, I'll ask you what aspect is. What I'm trying to say is that the study of aspect would have to supplement the study of time. Or we couldn't do a science of time, a chronology of any sort, if you will, without also doing a science or a study of aspect. If we were trying to understand what time is, if time is the measure of motion of objects for Aristotle, or things, nature, the becoming of nature. We would also have to ask not only about the time of nature, but about the aspect of nature. So not only how nature comes to presence and goes out into absence, but how it does so completely or incompletely, continuously, repeatedly. These are aspectual determinations that are precisely not temporal determinations, irreducible to temporal determinations. This opens up a whole new science or study that needs to be done if we're to understand even time. There's another to time aspect. So too with respect to the subject. If time is understood as the schema of sense, imagination, and knowledge, well, that also means that sensing, imagining, and knowing have an aspect. I sense continuously, discontinuously, completely, incompletely. These are not temporal determinations and can't be reduced to temporal determinations, precisely. So that if time is a universal, even for Heidegger, so too aspect, just as universal. And therefore, we need to think about the way in which being, 
both has its time, presence and absence, and its aspect, complete or incomplete.